like to welcome everybody to today's uh, work session this uh, May 10th, 2023. Can we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Montine, can I have a roll call, please? Ms. Clucci? Here. Dr. Janopoulos? Here. Mr. Polis? Here. Mrs. Alaya? Here. And Mr. Warren? Here. Thank you. Item four, honorees. Craig? Okay. Uh, everybody can hear me. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for being here tonight and uh, celebrating a, um, uh, our retirees. We're going to do this annually, every day. Um, what we would like to do, uh, for the pleasures of the board, we're going to um, have each of the administrators that work the most with uh, our uh, honorees tonight step up and say a few quick words about everybody. We have a certificate for them. I had a cruise book for all of you and the treasure, so I'm not going to do it. Beautiful cruise to the Caribbean, so I can do it. So uh, I apologize. I So, and then after we're finished, just we wanted to break, we did take a quick recess. We have some refreshments to everybody. And, um, and uh, again, we'll keep doing this every day to honor and celebrate everyone. And before we get started also, I know there's some teachers here. Uh, on behalf of the board, we'd like to wish everybody a happy Teacher Appreciation Week. We appreciate everybody and all of our educators. But uh, uh, looking forward to this week celebrating all of So with further ado, I think we could maybe start with uh, Principal Schneider, um, you can leave, you're the lead off. First time in life for everything. Yeah, I, I've been blessed. I got three tonight, and we had them write a few of their words uh, to give us some information that I would like to add to. I went in alphabetical, so it doesn't mean I like anybody more or less. Love you all to say. Okay, first off is uh, Miss Michelle Saccone. Um, she was hired in 2005 in September. She's got 20 and a half years of service. Um, she's been at Dobbins Elementary as a secretary. But come on up, Michelle. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're going to embarrass her. I get, if I get the lead off that, we're, we're putting everybody on the spot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I want to hand you a certificate, you. and then that way if I screw something up, you can go like, don't forget. Um, she was also a secretary at McKinley Elementary, and then we've been blessed to have her as our guidance secretary uh, at Poland Seminary. She didn't put any accomplishments, but I will fill those in for us because she sees me every morning and I'm not the most morning person. She's always got a smile on her face and she uh, is the most welcoming person I could ever meet and truly like family. We have our little Italian discussions about family and all those things. So she, uh, she is too humble. Um, some things she said she'll miss the uh, most is the staff and students. And her next phase of life, which is again, right down her wheelhouse with family is, is spending time with her granddaughters and traveling. Um, She's got three graduates from Poland, three grandchildren, two on the way. Congratulations. You get a hug. This, no, 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 no. Um, next is uh, Mr. Dave DiGiacomo. Come on up, Dave. Um, he was hired in 1996. He's uh, 34 and a half years. Um, after seven years at Youngstown City, he's had the last 27 here. We've been blessed to have him here at Poland. Um, He's taught sciences, mostly chemistry and the physical sciences with us. He's coached basketball with Jamie Dunn. He was assistant track and golf coach for 22 years. Um, as part of his uh, kind of resume, he's been great. He's done some things through the Wolves Club in Youngstown, worked to raise money and scholarships so that we've been able to award Poland students, graduates, uh, scholarships from the Wolves Club, Wolves Club sorry, uh, to YSU. Things he'll miss most, um, he will miss the people that he's had the privilege to work with for such a long time. And we'll also miss him because he, he's a, not only a, a great person, but a, I don't know how to explain it, but someone you can lean on. And it's, uh, I always used to say that the guy you want in the trench with you. Um, and that, that, that's more than I, that, that's in my world, that's as a personal and, and a professional thing. Those, you can't get, have enough of those people. So um, his next phase of life, he plans on staying active and busy and uh, keeping his mind occupied. Knowing him, I know he'll be able to do that. Um, he's, as a pertinent information he wanted to add is he's blessed to be a small part of a great school system, being able to live in Poland, raise his daughter here, could have not happened without the Poland schools. Totally grateful to be here and thankful to the Board of Ed, and he said you can uh, count on him as a yes vote, as long as he's alive here in Poland. Oh. All right, last but surely not least, Mrs. Ruth Riley, 
She was hired in August 1989. She's got 35 years of service. She uh, has taught business education, and then she's been our library and media specialist. Um, in the past, she's been freshman advisor. She ran the seminary and school newspaper. She was also a department chair. And then uh, since I've been there, she's been our senior class advisor, thank God, and our LPDC, uh, one of the representatives. Um, accomplishments for her, she shared that making the library a welcoming environment, which I would agree. Um, smooth graduation ceremonies, which I really agree. Um, and then um, implementing testing procedures and help. So again, she's way too humble because she has taken on in the last 10 years the amount of testing stuff for us, with us, and, and the organizational thing, um, she didn't, it, it's incredible. So I can't say enough to that part, because we're kind of wired the same, which usually that's conflict, but it's actually been great, because I've been able to say, okay, she got it, and she's always got it. And then she's also my therapist for that month and a half <laughs> during March. <laughs> so um, things she'll miss the most is the student lunch crew. She has a great group of kids that eat lunch with her every day. Uh, the Christmas assembly, and, and also working with her friends. And then she plans on her next phase of life, enjoying six Saturdays and one Sunday every week. So uh, blessed again and can't say enough about her. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I've got uh, four people that I'd like to talk about here tonight for just a moment. Um, the first being Lois Dunavant, uh, who is not with us tonight. Lois is at home recovering from some surgery and injuries that she had sustained, but um, Lois is, is one of those people who, when you think about what makes us great, she's one of those people. Lois will do anything you ask of her for, a, for an adult or a student at any time. Um, Lois will always stay after or always come early if it means helping out someone here at the school. Um, Lois has worked in a lot of capacities as a monitor here throughout the years at the, at the school district. Um, she currently works at the middle school and helps out at the McKinley Elementary building at times. Um, she's one of our full day monitors. She always adds joy to those around her. She adds uh, discipline to those kids that need it when she's overseeing uh, those areas that, that they need, um, but disciplines with love. And we always say when we have people that do that, um, they're adding value to the lives of the kids that are around them. So Lois is a, is a big part of our family at the middle school, and we're going to miss her tremendously. Um, and we wish she could be here, but we're hoping she has a uh, continued recovery. So Lois Donovan, if we just, even though she's not here. Next person I'm going to introduce is Nancy Morrow. If Nancy could come up here, please. So I don't have Nancy's stats, but here's what I'm, here's what I'm going to say. So can I just ask how many years, Nancy? 22. 22 years. Um, Nancy, I'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective. I was never immediately Nancy's principal, but I had the fortune to, to be in the same complex with her this past year. And one of the things I want to talk to you about is my experience as a parent having my kids go through Union and then, then through McKinley. Um, Nancy, people don't realize how important a building secretary is to the principal and to the operation of the building in general. And Nancy runs the show and ran the show, and, and I mean that as a tremendous compliment. If you want to know anything about how things work, how things should work, um, being prepared for the school year to start, helping other people be prepared in other roles. Nancy was always organized, always prompt, and always kind when she worked with, with our constituents and our, and our kids. Um, I know that it's just as a parent, when I would call the school before I ever worked here, um, Nancy is the one you call. Everything was always taken care of with the highest level of excellence. And so when I, when I think of what, what we should say to Nancy is, I just want to thank you for your excellence over the years. I think everything I've ever experienced and those that I know you have experienced it were excellence, and I appreciate you. So congratulations. Two other um, important people I want to talk about. Um, the first one, again, isn't able to make it tonight, Susie McNally. Susie was a 1997 full-time hire uh, here at Poland. She worked in 1993 as a part-time tutor. She started, she started her career at Marcus Street Elementary in Boardman and also taught at Jackson Milton High School, uh, or Middle School, I'm sorry. 29 and a quarter years of full-time service. She taught uh, Latin, French, and Spanish in Poland for three years. She taught remedial reading at the K-5 level. 
She was a seventh and eighth grade English teacher and then spent the majority of her career in fifth grade where she's taught language arts, math, science, and social studies. She was part of the Children's International Summer Villages program over her career um, where she took students to Norway, Sweden, Denmark, England uh, for five weeks of travel during the summer for travel and education. Some of her accomplishments, this one blew me away. You ready? State champion gymnast. She was a mental health advocate and specialized in dyslexia screening and training. Things she'll miss the most is the students' free spirits and energy. Um, it's very contagious and she's going to miss seeing her friends at school every single day. Things that she plans for the next phase, she get her, her European citizenship and travel to Europe and plans on living there part of the year with her daughter in either Portugal or Ireland where her daughter makes home. She plans to continue uh, working with the mentally ill on a state level, pushing for change in laws and awareness, and plans to continue missions work in youth ministry. Um, so we're very, very thankful uh, for Susie being part of our family as well, and just uh, appreciate her service. This is Mark Cody. I won't look at her because then I'll start crying. It'll be a mess. Okay, Mrs. Marconi. Mrs. Marconi currently serves as our STEM teacher for grades four through eight. Uh, she's also taught seventh and eighth grade math and science. She started, she's been 18 years with the district. She started in 2006 as a tutor, and the very next year was hired as a science and math teacher. Other involvement, she's a middle school science department chair and middle school STEM club advisor. Her accomplishments? She developed the Poland Local School STEM program for grades four through eight, wrote and received grants totaling over $5,000 for equipment used in the STEM program. Selected to participate in professional development, including embedded teachers program, and she'll be flying zero G flight in November with students experiments right here from, from Poland. She's uh, been involved in a teacher air camp, camp where she actually flew a plane, Honeywell Educator Space Camp, Yellowstone STEAM Institute, Simon STEM Academy, visited the White House as part of that program, and presented at the Space Exploration Educators Conference in Houston, Texas, and the National Science Teachers Association in Atlanta, Georgia. Every spring, I could rely upon Jill to say, Dave, what do you think about? And it was, I'm going to fly in space, fly a plane, zero gravity. Um, but the cool thing about it, honestly, was she always had her students in mind. Every single time she did those things over the summer, she came back and embedded those into programs within her classroom. Um, fourth through eighth grade STEM is a challenging job to make things engaging. And each and every grade level had different engaging activities every single time they went through. Uh, and that was extremely appreciated. She put a lot of passion in what she does. She'll miss starting a new year with exciting new projects to bring to the students that she learned about during the summer. Students being so engaged in an activity that they don't want to leave her classroom at the end of class and working with the best colleagues in the education profession. In the next phase, she'll be working part-time for the Ohio Space Grant Consortium as a K-12 education specialist on a program called Stepping Stars, which is funded by NASA. And then she plans to, believe it or not, travel, travel, travel. So, other information she wants to share is that she wants to express her gratitude for the opportunity to be part of the Bulldog family. 18 years went by so fast. Aside from being a wife and mother, it's the best job she's ever had. I wish the best students and staff at Poland Local Schools my very best. So congratulations, Joe. We appreciate and love you. Thank you. Uh, it's my honor to uh, honor six, <laughs> six employees tonight. So one a custodian and the other five are uh, in the transportation department, bus drivers. So um, I believe Barb is the only one. So I, no way, I want to call you up last. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I, I could do that. So um, I'm going to start off with Karen Malone. Karen Malone uh, is a custodian at the middle school, McKinley Complex. Uh, she started in 1997, 25 years of experience. Um, she's worked 
pretty much every classified position that I can think of. She started in transportation, moved into food service, then went into custodial, uh, worked her way up through custodial, and is ending her career as a night custodian, um, or general custodian as we call it, um, at the middle school McKinley. Um, one of her accomplishments is her school pride, um, her dedication to the schools. She has, when you go retire and you have all your sick time, she's been at work every day, so uh, that's, that's a great accomplishment for her. Um, the thing that she's going to miss the most is the staff that she works with, teachers and uh, other classified staff. So um, the only thing she's going to do is enjoy retirement. <laughs> so she's going to just, um, that's it, uh, as far as what she wanted to do for the rest of the time. So. Um, on to transportation. So Mike Medvick, um, he started um, 9 of 11, 12 years of experience. He was bus driver here for us the entire time. Um, he will miss most his students and his routes. Um, and in his retirement, he is uh, going to enjoy time with his family. Uh, John, John Gingry started January of 13, 10 years, uh, just decided to retire this year. Um, he was a bus driver, former cafeteria worker. He's also moved around and um, just took over for Barb this past couple months, or ca couple months as the courier here at the schools. Um, thing he's going to miss the most is his students and routes. There's a common theme here with uh, all the transportation. And um, he's going to enjoy traveling and spending time with his family. Bob Hartman um, started in 2011. He has 12 years of experience, bus driver, again. Um, he has an uh, exemplary uh, attendance record. That's what he, he feels is one of his best accomplishments. The students uh, on his bus is what he's going to miss the most and uh, enjoy gardening while retired. So. Uh, Bill Donovan started in 2014, nine years as a bus driver the entire time. Um, his thing that he's going to miss most is students on his route, the other bus drivers and employees um, within the schools. And uh, he plans on doing some traveling and enjoying time with his family. All right, Barb, you can come up now. <laughs> There you go. And you can tell me when I am get everything wrong. Okay. okay. So, um, <laughs> Barb started March of 97, 26 years, right? Um, bus driver the entire time, uh, courier for many of those years. She is and or was the most senior bus driver we've had. Um, so, the things you're going to miss most, students. <laughs> Employees and coming to see me. <laughs> All of our meetings. So, um, yeah. She uh, plans on enjoying retirement with family, uh, a new grandchild this year, which was, I'm one sure, on one of Friday. the reasons. And another one, you said? No, it'll be one on Friday. One on Friday, yeah. So, um, and travel. I didn't know if you had any travel Vegas plans. Vegas on the 20th. Vegas on the 20th. So uh, appreciate everything you've done. It was great to work with you. Thanks. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Could we do a recess? Sure. Yeah. yeah. About a five minute recess and then uh, five, whatever. And then um, we're going to hear about our strategic plan uh, that we want to talk about. So. Yeah. And then, and those who don't want to stay there for the rest of the meeting, <laughs> All right, we're back in session. Um, item five, presentations. Dr. John Richard, overview of strategic plan. You're up, boss. As uh, John gets ready, um, I just wanted to tell the board, I, um, uh, after we did our annual review, one of the things that um, we reflected on, and I know we mentioned in, in the review, was the uh, lack of a strategic plan and totally agreed. was so glad that was brought up because uh, immediately I met with Maria and we 
we'd started looking at um, a lot of options, you know, and worked uh, with some third party people and the price was completely out of our range. Um, and then we got introduced to Dr. Richard and we went through the whole thing. We've done some preliminary work with him and uh, he was gracious enough to come up. Um, if we agree, like what we have, ask any questions, any concerns, anything, and then we'd like to bring it forth uh, to start the work uh, on May 17th, if it works out uh, for us all. So thanks. Okay. Thanks so much, Superintendent Hockenberry. And uh, thanks to all of you for everything that you do. Uh, I, I always view the role of board members as service uh, before self, because that's really what it is. I was just talking to a couple of the principals and uh, I, for a while I, I did some instruction at the University of Akron and uh, also worked at, at an organization that supports principals. And uh, I feel like that role is, is maybe the most difficult today in terms of the administrative roles, just because the day in and the day out. But also, uh, as a result, I think of these past, let's call it five years or so, with the multitude of culture wars going on, uh, as well as the, the pandemic that then seemed to exacerbate everything. Uh, I'm not sure that I would want to be serving on a local school board. It's a, I, I think it's a, uh, in many ways, it's a no win in terms of you as an individual. But at the end of the day, I have great respect for what you're doing because you're still there for the students in Poland. And that, that has to be hopefully somewhere just a tad bit rewarding. Uh, so anyway, thank you and thank you for the opportunity. So as, uh, as Superintendent Hockenberry uh, mentioned, we've met a couple times uh, via phone, I think virtual and then, then in person try to get a kind of a lay of the land here, at least initial. And uh, so what I'll go through tonight is my approach, uh, which is hopefully very common sense. Uh, I'll give you just a tad bit of my background uh, because I, I am not a consultant by trade. I've done coaching and some consulting a bit on the side, but because of the roles I've been in, I've always been in the public sector and could not officially uh, do that because of conflicts of interest and so forth. But let me just give you a few, uh, a few tidbits. Uh, so one of the reasons I listed the positions I've been in here is because each one of these in one way or another uh, had strategic planning involved with it, either leading it or co-leading it or being a participant in it. And so even the part-time instructing at the University of Akron, we went through a major revision there when I was on staff and uh, I was part of those conversations. I go back though to uh, actually even before the superintendency as an assistant superintendent with Dr. Dan Ross. Some of you may know his name from high school athletics, but we were in Avon Lake together. I was his assistant superintendent. And so I took on kind of the teaching and instruction and the personnel side of the strategic planning at that point. Perry Local Schools, uh, I came in and probably very much like uh, the superintendent here, uh, within a year, the board really wanted to engage in strategic planning. It had been seven or eight years at that point and it was a, a bit of a dust collector at that stage. And so we went through a process as well and the board actually asked me if I would lead it myself. So I led our own strategic plan there. Uh, from there, I went to the Ohio Association of Secondary School Administrators, OASSA. Uh, probably your, certainly your high school administrator is, is a member of that organization. And we would assist uh, those going through strategic planning uh, in their process. And then uh, from there, I was the, the number two at the Department of Education in Columbus. Please don't shoot me. Sometimes I get daggers uh, my way when I say that. Uh, I actually loved every single minute of being at the department. Uh, but we went through, again, a major strategic plan process that I was part of the leadership of that plan, helped do the editing, the writing, all of those things that are involved with strategic planning. And then uh, finally, as the president of a nonprofit that connects education and business, 
Uh, we went through a strategic plan process uh, right after I came on board a year and a half ago. Uh, I guess it's closer to two years at this point. And uh, what I thought was going to be about a year before we started uh, became very evident to me within literally about two weeks on the job that we needed to start a strategic plan process as well. Uh, so I led that from, from my role there along with a facilitator. So I just wanted to give you a bit of that background uh, so you know kind of how I'm coming to this. And uh, now I'm starting to go out a bit on my own uh, in these types of situations to help districts through this. Uh, the other one thing I will say here, the reason I have the word facilitator and not, I, I don't need a, a, you know, a fancier title than that because this really has to be Poland's plan. This cannot be John Richard's strategic plan. So I am here in my role to probably do a, a few things. One is to listen really well uh, to what the situation is here. Uh, secondly, is to then capture that uh, to the best of my ability in notes and then in writing and ultimately in a document uh, that becomes a, a guiding document and hopefully not something that sits on a shelf. Uh, and so that synthesis is a big part of, of, our, or of my role as well. And then just to reemphasize that my role is to capture where Poland is going. It's really, I'll, I'll get into this in a few minutes, but it's you know, primarily tied to vision, where you want to be and where you see yourselves, that kind of hoped for future. And so I start with this chart, and this is a chart uh, that I've often used when leading change, uh, but also um, it's just about what effective organizations do in terms of what are the elements that go into an effective process or an effective organization, you could say, in terms of how initiatives are approached, how change is approached, and so I just want to walk you through the kind of the top row. And this goes back to the first time I ever used this came out of the Center for Creative Leadership out of North Carolina. They do leadership worldwide. And so you can see that it, it begins with data, that if you don't know current status through observable data, then it's, you're going to be guessing at a lot of things. Um, from that kind of current status, that naturally flows into, here's where we are, where do we want to be? And that, of course, is, is vision, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Then there are other elements that include skills, and that's the skill set of all involved to make that vision a reality. What the incentives are, uh, it can't be just at the board level or the superintendent's level but there has to be staff involved at all levels along the way as well. And so the incentives have to be something that, the, frankly, the district has to decide that. I can't come in from the outside and say, here are the three incentives that are going to work. Um, and of course, resources play a, a big part of this. Our treasurer um, hopefully identifies with that statement, but you cannot think about anything being effective without identifying the resources to get it done. Uh, and then comes action planning and finally at the end evaluation of whether things are working or not. All of those elements combined and I could throw in culture of a place kind of underlying it, but generally you'll get fairly decent results out of that. And I'll take you through one or three, one or two rows here. The first is data. If data is missing, so you're, we're on the second row, and every other element is there, you end up basing a lot on perception rather than reality. Might, you might get lucky, but if you don't have some data to support it, you end up making a lot of decisions based on perception. Next, and I, I'll, I'll stop after vision, but if you have data and you have all the other elements in play, but there's no clear vision, where are we headed, then there's going to be confusion because people are doing a lot of activity, but they're not quite sure why. Or, you know, some are going here, and it, you, we've probably all seen the arrows pointing in, you know, 10 different directions. That's what that's about. The reason I stopped there is because most of our strategic plan work is going to be around the idea 
of vision. There, and I'll go through how we go down to a certain level. But for the most part, the other elements there are elements that happen day to day. And it's, it's decisions that are made uh, certainly at the board level, but how that plays itself out then uh, through staff and through decisions, through the financial uh, support, all of those other things. And so I want to make sure that we kind of all understand that the strategic plan really is about vision and then about the map or the road, however you, whatever analogy you want to use to see that vision realized. It's a hoped for future. And so with that, I'll transition. Um, this is Rocky Mountain National Park, one of my favorite places on earth. Uh, many people choose the beach. I always demonstrate my analogies with a mountain. And so that's up at about, uh, we're, you're almost at tree line, so we're probably at about 10,000, 10,500 feet there. And that particular lake is one that uh, is one of uh, our favorites, our being my wife and myself. And so we've hiked up there, I, I think, three times now. But to get to that particular point in Rocky Mountain National Park is about an eight mile distance, and it's about 3,500 feet of elevation gain. And so it's important before we know where we want to go, that's our picture. But we have to decide which trail, because there are at least three different ways to get there, some longer, some harder, some a tad bit easier. And so I use that because that's really what the strategic plan becomes. We will spend time making sure vision is right and resonates, because we have to know where we're headed first. Then the strategic planning process from there will be about which trail, maybe it's a couple trails, to get us there. And that really becomes the strategies. So when we talk strategy, it's kind of, it's about the way we get there. Eventually, those other things on the chart that I showed might be if we decide to take a dirt path or if we decide to pave it with asphalt and so forth. And that's where I say that becomes more of district level decisions. I don't need to spend my time doing that unless you really want to engage long term here. Uh, but that's, that's why I demonstrate that. So it's so um, just intricately linked strategic planning to vision because without that very clear picture first, then we'll be guilty of all of the activities around planning and things and actions without really knowing where we're headed in the end. So we'll spend some time up front uh, in that space. Okay. So what I want to do now is put a little bit more um, kind of flesh on those statements that I just made. And so I'll give you a bit of the, the overview of, of how we'll get there. And again, at this point, this has been based on meeting with, with our superintendent and with Dr. Hoffmaster and understanding kind of what things have looked like here over the past couple years. So the first thing I would say, and this now kind of gets into that space of vision and strategies, is to understand what is valued here in Poland Local School District. Uh, that's going to be really critical that we land on that early on, that we do have a clear picture of where it is we want to be. And one of the decisions, and in, in, in some ways it, it doesn't necessarily matter, but I generally would recommend a three to five year type of plan. Any more, I think the way things change legislatively, technology-wise, um, if the strategies aren't strategies that you can begin implementing in the next six to 12 months, uh, they may not be the right strategy or a right strategy to go into the plan at this point. Um, at the other end of that, when we start getting beyond four and five years, uh, oftentimes you'll find that the plan becomes very irrelevant about three to four years in. And so if nothing else, and again, we'll talk through this as we go along, but 
Uh, one way to uh, kind of counter that is to say we're going to do a bit of a refresh annually or maybe every two years. And at some point you'll know if it's time to just say this is kind of our history, it's time to go with an entirely new document. But there's, this should be a document in the end that you can update as things change in the district. And so that's, again, when I say kind of a common sense approach, if it's, if it's so static that two years from now when there's a new bill that's introduced and passes, or there's, a, you know, we're all kind of living through how the, the new um, financial situation looks in the end when it's fully implemented, all those things, then this kind of a plan has to be able to change along with changing conditions. Uh, so that's really important. Um, the strategies then uh, are, as I said, it's really how we get there after we've established what that vision is. And then the goals are kind of bigger picture aspirations underneath each strategies. That's as deep as, as I generally go, go in this kind of a space with a strategic plan. If you start drilling down beneath that, you're really getting into tactics and initiatives of action plans that are going to be extremely detailed. And that's where I would say I think that the district administration and teachers, they are the experts in that space. Um, again, certainly I have done that work and led it myself in district and so forth. I generally don't say that you need me to guide you through that unless uh, things are, are really struggling. Uh, so let me again now show kind of a, a bit of what I would mean uh, in this. So a, an example of a value of a school district is the belief that all students can learn. You see that fairly often, but sometimes it's worth just taking a bit of time. Do we really believe that? Does every teacher approach it in his or her classroom? And how is that demonstrated? How do we know what's it look like? So to take a bit of time on what it is we believe about education in Poland is worth a bit of time on the front end. Secondly, uh, an example of vision. And again, this is fairly common, but it gives a fairly clear picture of what we expect of students as they exit our school system and make that transition to next step in life. And so I just pulled one um, students will graduate from Poland local schools, enrolled in further education, employed in a sustaining career, or enlisted in the military. Again, nothing necessarily special about that, but it paints a picture of what students are experiencing as they leave. And so th this is sometimes where people struggle a bit. So how do you then, um, you know, develop a strategy around that visionary statement? And so one strategy might be something as simple as Poland local schools will connect students to local career opportunities. Okay, still pretty broad, but that's, that's a strategy because there can be a lot of work underneath that, that strategy. It could be one strategy of its own and you could probably have three to five goals under that, and that, that's when then you get into tactics and work plans and so forth. But again, let's drill down one more level to what a goal might be under the strategy of connecting students to local career opportunities. And that is, at the high school level, we want every single student to experience two work-based learning experiences. So that becomes part of the DNA of a high school spirit, uh, student's experience. Uh, and so that would be one goal. Most likely there would be two or three others. It might be introduction to careers, soft skills uh, courses, so forth, could be some other goals there. And so that's the idea of how far we go, or again, I would recommend going with strategic planning. I can certainly get into those other areas, uh, but as I said at the outset, I believe those are really, they, that's when it starts becoming district decisions after that. So this is what uh, my plan is, again, based on talking to uh, your two leaders here in central office. 
Um, the, from, maybe I should pause there and just see if anybody has any reactions or questions to that. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Yeah, let's see. And I'm comfortable to keep going. <laughs> what would say, would you say are the biggest challenges that strategic planning faces? Because, you know, if you look at all the political entities in this region, schools, counties, townships, cities, they've all done a lot of strategic planning. Most of them sit and gather dust. Uh, Poland did one about six years ago uh, and uh, didn't really have the success that I don't think that everybody wanted or any, that, at least the majority wanted. So what would you say are the biggest challenges when you do in, in, on a global basis? So probably two come to to mind. One is on the front end, one's kind of on the back end. And the first is that the strategic plan somehow doesn't represent what people really believe and value and think where this is where we're headed. That there's a perception that this was done by people at the top and really didn't engage. Um, that's, I think, one issue. The second is the hard work of implementation. And I say that because it, it really is hard work. This document should be realistic enough where it acts as a filter, it acts as a guide for the, for the district as you move forward. And that's why it's so important to understand the vision. If the, the sample vision resonates in Poland, then you can easily start building strategy from that. And you can come up with some goals. Oftentimes, that's where it sits. And implementation in terms of now developing an action plan of who's responsible for that goal ultimately. What's the time boundness of it? All of those things that put it, it's really you know, project management at that point. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, that's where just things happen and new legislation comes along, something else. and and the district becomes guilty of just whatever the flavor of the day is, and we really don't go back to this. And so I would encourage everyone here, and I'll get to the makeup of the, the leadership team and so forth, that this has to be a document that everybody believes in and believes reflects the, the values and the vision of where Poland Schools is headed. At that point then, in my mind anyway, um, I, that's the fun. To me, it's like now let's take that strategic plan and build everything out of it. And that's, again, the work that kind of starts with, with Craig and Maria, but has to happen at every level. And oftentimes that it feels like it stops at that kind of upper administrative level and never really filters down. If I could just add to one of the challenges I've seen in different districts is uh, great intentions, lots of hard work. People put together great, great plans and uh, turnover in education becomes very problematic. Um, when we did a strategic plan a few years ago at uh, my last district and 100 percent of the people that worked on it were no longer with the district, including the board. So when I got there, no one even knew we had a strategic plan, but nobody even really knew that much about it because turnover is so much. So. And, and that building on that comment, that's why culture, I kind of threw that out early on, like you could say culture. I, I actually did a little thing on culture this morning. But Daniel Coyle, who's a, a leader in terms of culture, he works, at least he did work with the Cleveland Indians as well and kind of done leadership development all over the world. But Everything he teaches is just based on years, actually decades of observation about great companies and, and what they've been through regarding culture. And one of the um, kind of characteristics of companies who have a really positive culture but actually follow through is they have their phrases, their words that everybody understands just plastered on walls. They talk it. They, it just happens consistently, and my point in bringing that up is to your point, uh, Superintendent Hockenberry, is if that doesn't happen and there is changeover, it's really easy that everything just, again, falls away. 
Um, so it's, it kind of plays into that implementation. Anyone else? Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about, I must be double hitting this, uh, strategic planning leadership team. So I want to pause here. And as I met with, uh, with Craig and Maria, one of the things I found out is back in 2021, when the superintendent was hired here, he did, I think it was 65 plus uh, in-home visits just to go out and kind of conduct a, a bit of a listening tour and start understanding what is it about Poland local schools that kind of make things happen, but also what, what's on people's minds. 2022, Dr. Hoffmaster is hired, and there's like an additional, I think, 120 in-home visits and meetings. So there have been well over 200 meetings that have taken place primarily for the purpose of listening to people, to community members, to uh, teaching staff, so forth and so on. And so that's one of the, the major reasons when you see the timeline. I don't believe that I need to help facilitate 15 more meetings with stakeholders. Maybe that will come back to me and people will say, you know what, you really, we need to go listen to this group. But you'll see the makeup of a strategic planning leadership team here. And the idea is that, the, and this would be up to roughly 20 people, so we get a good mix of representation. Uh, the first thing, of course, is the, the board on that list, and I would ask that two board members participate. Why two? You probably all know that way you don't have to call a meeting every time, every time you meet together to discuss uh, district business. Uh, but you'll see that we've, we've essentially included every stakeholder in the district here as well. And so what I would be hoping from all of you is that you'll have representation in these various spots that represent the community, the teachers, the, the schools uh, in a way that they will know if what these two have done and all the listening, if that actually makes sense and yes, that is what resonates with this community. If we need to step back and say, you know what, we didn't quite get this right, we better go back out to these two or three groups, we can do that. That will, you know, lengthen the, the time but in talking through this with them initially, I don't believe we need to take that step. And so this is a bit streamlined in terms of the timing. Um, I, I think as I talk to the two of them and question them on it, I think part of the concern is if we go back and do this again, people are going to start feeling as if we didn't listen the first time or haven't I already shared this like two or three times with you in the past two years. And so, assuming that that information gleaned from all of those conversations is accurate and the representation on the leadership team agrees with that, then I don't think we need to spend that much time in going out and holding, you know, 10 or 15 stakeholder meetings uh, if we're going to glean the same information and we run the risk of, frankly, ticking people off because they've already you know, been through this process. So that is something, again, uh, when I say realistic and just common sense, uh, you don't need to be spending your dollars for something that's already, I think, been done pretty well and pretty thoroughly uh, over the past year and a half to two years. Uh, so with that said, again, I don't think I need to uh, to go through this list one by one, but the idea is that we would have roughly 18 to 20 members in total and that they do represent these constituents well, that they can speak. And the idea that they're committing to is as we kick this off officially in August, that they would be committing to three in-person meetings, uh, probably the first in August being a two to three hour session. And so we'll, we'll figure out how that works. And then two additional meetings in the fall, 
probably 90 minutes to two hours in length. Um, but in between those meetings, there could be some Zoom calls. Uh, there definitely will be feedback and review of as we start putting some documents together and capturing what we might end up with in a strategic plan. This is the group that is committing to being able to review, provide very honest feedback, and then those few meetings that I talked about with potentially some online meetings in, in the interim if, if we need to really kind of dig into something a bit more. Um, so, so that would be the commitment from that group. And again, knowing that they are representing a larger audience, the two board members, I'm assuming we'll come back to work sessions and share where we're at. Um, the other thing I'll just, again, kind of real quick sidetrack is you can anticipate uh, that on a monthly basis, once we kick this off officially in August, that you'll get some kind of feedback either through your superintendent, through your board reps, or if you decide you'd like me to come back out and share what I've listened, happy to do that. Uh, so that is the way the, the actual um, leadership team, and so this would be our go-to group uh, through this entire process. So then finally, uh, what does the timeline look like? Again, because of the, I think, really great work, and I say I think because I haven't dug in tremendously let, yet, uh, because I'm not hired, <laughs> uh, to be honest, but from what I've seen early on, um, it really looks like there was a thorough job of listening and trying to identify you know, some themes and so forth. And so I see the work unfolding over the summer of beginning to you know, kind of put that together, affirming that these look like maybe some themes that we should bring to that group right off the bat. Um, and then establish our dates in the fall so everybody gets them on their calendar early. Uh, and then also, again, just kind of work through what does the planning of this look like. So um, I, I know, I, th I think we've already drafted a letter that would go out to this group, and we can add some of those details into that letter. But as I've thought about it, I think that's a, a process to get us started where I can be doing some work with your administration uh, through the summer to make sure we're set well uh, as we kick things off. Then in August, uh, there would be that two to three hour meeting with the leadership team uh, representing all of those constituents, those stakeholders, uh, and we'll uh, also decide do we need to develop and distribute any surveys just to you know, affirm the themes we come up with. If we do see a need to go back and re-engage with some stakeholder groups, it potentially could be as, as easy as surveys. Uh, so again, we don't feel like, you know, don't want people to feel like they've already met with me before, why am I coming back? So that if we do feel that need, we might be able to accomplish that through survey development. September and October, uh, again, assuming we don't have a hiccup early on and feel like we need to slow down the process. September and October really would be to, as we start developing the themes or the kind of those large buckets that most likely would become the strategies, then that's the time to start reflecting and those other two meetings would primarily be done probably one in each of these two months to have that conversation again with feedback ahead of time so we're cognizant of people's time and we don't ask them to start spending days with us, but that they've had time to review, to reflect, and then can bring ideas to those meetings. And um, that's how we begin developing the, uh, uh, the strategic plan itself. Um, the other thing I didn't say jumping back to August is we would really spend a good bit of that time, uh, probably the first hour to maybe 90 minutes, getting vision right. So before we move on from there, we don't start jumping in again to the planning without having a clear picture of we've got our vision right. This is where we want to go. And again, that could be a hiccup. Uh, if we can't come to agreement on that, I've seen people wordsmith 
uh, visions uh, to death, <laughs> really. And um, oftentimes in the end, they come back to, to something that uh, resonates with everyone. But um, the idea is hopefully not to wordsmith, but capture a general idea. Is this a clear picture that gets everybody there? Anyway, sorry for the, the kind of backing up there for a second. Um, November would be primarily uh, on myself in terms of now we've got the strategies identified from the past two to three months. It's time to really start committing this to writing. And so a good bit of that work is going to be on me, but with the idea that as, as we develop the draft plan, that it's going back and forth with that larger leadership team. We might subdivide to kind of divide and conquer at that point if somebody, you know, let's say one of the, um, the strategies were to come out about career connections. Okay, who, who most likely on that leadership team, do we have a business person from the community who probably could speak into that? And maybe a board member and maybe a high school teacher who's been involved in that they might really review that section. So we're not asking 20 people to review, you know, 12 or 15 pages, but maybe it's a chunk of two or three pages. Do we have this right? So that's what's happening uh, while we're drafting the, the plan itself. And then uh, as we get closer to a final draft, uh, then roughly December, and again, we all kind of know what happens in December, uh, so I put December, January here is the written deliverable from me uh, back to you. And of course, this is going to, there, there shouldn't be any surprises at that point uh, because you'll have this, as I said, on a monthly basis. But ultimately, uh, then the superintendent would recommend the uh, strategic plan for adoption. And that would be the final step in terms of the the plan itself, the document. That's when then all the fun begins of, of coming up with all of the other implementation um, tactics and uh, plans and so forth. So this is really the, the outline. The one thing I, I didn't mention, if we go back to those strategies, uh, typically what I find is if you start going beyond about two pages per strategy, people get buried in text and it becomes somewhat, um, again, what we don't want it to be is something that's on a shelf somewhere a year and a half from now. And so we try to make it concise and clear. And then the other thing that I would do is create uh, most likely a two-page executive summary that just highlights here are however many strategies we end up with. Uh, here's how we'll get there, um, the goals that go with them, and so forth. Um, the other thing that uh, at the very end of this is the evaluation. How, how do you measure success of this plan? And again, we didn't build it into what I've proposed uh, with Superintendent Hockenberry. That's something, again, we can, can set that after we're into this six months, or the district can decide on, on that yourselves. That's not something, again, um, my conversations tell me that I think we've got a pretty adept group here in Poland that is able to pull this off without a great deal of consultant time and so forth. Uh, but that's always an option. Sometimes people get a little bit um, stuck on how do we go back and, and ultimately measure what we're doing. The other thing that I would highly suggest, I ran this past the superintendent, um, so hopefully he looked at my notes, but as a board, you should expect an annual or a semi-annual update on what the impact of the strategic plan is. Um, and it doesn't mean you're, let's say there are eight strategies in the end, that you're gonna have an update on all eight strategies, you know, six months out in June of next year, but probably two or three of those we've really kind of started digging into. And I would say, on strategies, I've seen as, as few as three or four, and I've seen as many, I know at the department we had 10 strategies um, with, with our most recent strategic planning. And so that sometimes can seem overwhelming, uh, but again, if it truly reflects 
where you are in those kind of important buckets, I think then it becomes a time for each strategy. Um, I forget which book I picked this up on, but it's called Fit, and it's really about is it feasible, the feasibility of each strategy. And if it's not feasible within the next three to four years or so, probably shouldn't be there. Um, what's the impact? You know, what is the bang kind of for our, our buck? Uh, what, what will we see that we can say this is having impact? Part of that goes back to what are the resources available behind it? Um, and is it meaningful enough where it's going to improve or change behavior in some way? And then the third part of that uh, fit is, is T, and that's for timeliness. And by timeliness, it's, you know, what's the order of the strategies? At some point, especially if you have more than, than four or five strategies in the end, of kind of ordering those out. And again, with the idea that if, if they're all not going to be at least a beginning on them in the next few years, they probably shouldn't be there. But also, what's the opportunity? Uh, is it an opportunity that, man, we can't let this go by us. We need to start this one now. So it's kind of about ordering and opportunities. And so as we start developing those buckets that I talked about in identifying strategies, I'll continually bring the, the leadership group back to feasibility, impact, and timeliness uh, as we work through those. Uh, so, so that's really, I, I think, all I've got. Uh, <laughs> um, and I, again, happy to entertain questions. But as I see it, I think this is a realistic timeline based on the pre-work that's already been accomplished here. Uh, but we'll, we'll adjust as we go along, uh, as, as it's needed. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and entertain questions and uh, let the superintendent entertain questions as well. Do you have any questions before I ask? I do. Um, so are you, will you help that um, leadership team to kind of, you know, 18 to 20 people is a lot of opinions. Yes. <laughs> and... Um, you know, um, logomachy is a fancy schmancy word for that, that over wordsmithing. So will you be kind of that person to kind of um, bring people, like hone them in? Are, are, you, are you part of those meetings, I guess, to help with that? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Or is yes. the um, intention that that team is going no, to? No, that, that would, those three meetings is part of my commitment as well. And that, that's why I started with the word facilitator, uh, is I will have to facilitate those types of issues as they come up. And that's, that's often, um, I guess this is my observation and a bit of experience, that role is needed maybe as much as anything else, and it doesn't put him or you in that role, it lets somebody else kind of take yeah. the heat of keeping things on track. So there'll be a, at the front end of that, there'll be some ground rules, all of those things, and we'll talk about you know something as simple as um, if you've had your voice heard three times already and Mr. Warren, I couldn't come up with your name, Mr. Warren hasn't spoken yet but has had his hand up three times, let's make sure Mr. Warren gets his chance. For it. So we'll set those kinds of ground rules. We'll also talk about opinions, wordsmithing, all of those things that go into that. And most likely, I'll have to step in and remind people from time to time. And then with that, I think one of the other issues that you know, Mr. Warren was talking about with not, not implementing previously is, is communication. And I think the one thing that the department did well with the strategic plan was simplifying it enough mm -hmm. and then getting it out there. Yes. And um, so I guess um, would you have a role or has that even been addressed? on terms of how to simplify all of this and then communicate it well in a way that everybody knows. Because I think before with the strategic plan, there was a lot to it, but it wasn't, although it was on the website, I don't think a lot of people knew about it. And there was just, like you said, there's pages and pages and pages. Right. So then you don't even know where to go. Whereas, you know, the one thing that the department had was just a simple, it is, that they had, yeah. we had a placemat, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, we, so, it, and when you communicate that well, then that gets out to Yeah, them. and I, that's a big part of the, the executive summary is, again, executive summaries, I typically say if they're beyond two pages, they're not a, an executive summary. And also finding a visual to draw people into it are uh, at 
the partnership where I'm currently president, uh, we have something very similar. We have two graphics that have become the, the starting point of every one of our slide presentations, and people know exactly what those three intersecting circles mean and what the, the um, kind of bullseye the is. Yes, Pardon? Good work. I'm a big fan. Oh, no, thank you. Good work. Okay. Anybody else? President Dinopoulos. I've got a question for you, probably a difficult question. So based on your timeline, uh, we obviously have a bond issue in November. So you're going to be completing a strategic plan without knowing the results of the bond. You're not going to have the um, alignment of the class classes, whether 7th, 8th still at the high school or not, something like that. And you're not going to have the financial data that you need, in my opinion, to, to create a positive strategic plan. So I guess my question to you is, so is that not important? Or how are you going to, um, how are you going to deal with that? Because we're going we're to discuss that a little bit later. But I mean, yes, we don't have a vision after November. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you, how is how is anybody else going to? John, can I take this one real quick? Because I, I sure. wanted to. Yeah. Uh, I may, I might so add just to it. Uh, um, and I, I've spoken to John about this as well. So what we know is that we have till November. So let's say it's done in November. And if the levy passes, we know it's going to be anywhere from 18 to 36 months before the buildings would be built and reconfigured anyways. So you see what I'm saying? We got a, we got a three year time frame or two and a half year time frame before that even would, would occur if it, and then if it doesn't pass, then we, 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 we have the draft in the same, but because that, does that make sense? So like no, not to me it doesn't because I mean, if the if the bond issue passes, that's going to change things. I would think from a visionary standpoint, okay. even even in the short term. And if it doesn't pass, it's going to change things from a visionary standpoint in the short term. I mean, I get your point that it, 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 three years it may be, it, it, we may be doing a new strategic plan, but we yeah. don't know what where we're going to be beforehand. Yeah. Could yeah, and I so. so my approach in, in one is we can always delay. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with that if you want to delay things a month or two. So we're closer. I assume that's a November vote, I think is what we talked about. But the other way we can approach that is that we approach it with a contingency because my guess is some of the, the buckets about how we want to educate and prepare students are going to happen regardless exactly. of whether, but there might be a strategy or two that's very much connected to that bond. And so my approach would be, what are we going to do regardless of whether a bond issue passes or not? And to, because that comes down to commitments and kind of, but to say, if it does, what changes? And that might become a parking lot kind of list of issues over here that we say when that happens, that becomes part of our conversation in November before we, we do that final draft. And, and that's, again, that's, to me, that's a hiccup that I don't think everything else should slow down because of that. But most likely, depending on what those strategies become, there'll be one or two of them that are tied very kind of intimately to that bond issue. Well, I guess from a, from a political standpoint, I don't want to be put in a position where you guys are paying someone to do a strategic plan. You don't even know where you're going yet until November. Why, why move forward now as opposed to waiting a couple of yeah. months, I guess, is, is, is my concern. I get we can build that, build that in, but as long as you're assuring us that you're going to build that in and we're not going to look like idiots when things fail or don't fail. I mean, that's the concern. That's my yeah. concern. And, and what I would go back to is this has to be your plan. Can't, can't be my plan. And if you're not comfortable with a start date and what is laid out, we'll adjust it. I mean, I, I'm not married to anything other than I'm engaging with you. And if ultimately you have the discussion and say, I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, there's no offense here. I under, I've been in, in school districts my whole life, and um, so that I understand local politics and where you have to be as a board. 
Uh, so you, you know, I, I will work with you, okay. and if you don't think that's a good idea, you know, we'll, we'll work through it and get past it. Can I um, just add to that, though? I think at the end of the day, though, what we value and our vision is the same. I mean, our vision is the same regardless of what facilities we have. Our strategies might change. And, and developing a vision takes forever, and I, I hate to delay it, because just a shared vision and, and, and agreeing on that does take time. And our vision is going to be the same ultimately, no matter what you know, what happens with the bond. It's what's going to change there is our strategies or, you know, how we're going to get there, how we're going to achieve that vision. It's going to be drastically different. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting, though, is uh, we talked about all the sessions that we did. There wasn't one single session of the 200 plus that facilities did not come up. So it's, it is going to be, Doc's right, it's a big, it's a big deal to not have the answer. But I'm concerned more not having a plan from a taxpayer's standpoint. Um, we're asking for a historic bond for the first time in you know very long time. And I want to know that the district has a plan in place, you know, so um, I think it's kind of, it's, it's interesting though, but Doc's right, there's not, one, there's not one conversation you can have with anybody in Poland where our facilities don't come into the conversation, so. Yeah, and, and you and I have already had this conversation, but your messaging is, is critical on the front end of this if you do decide to kick this off in August for that reason. Yeah. And um, that was part of the conversation the two of us have had al already. But um, again, I'm, I'm open to whatever is decided. Very good. The, the other thing I'd, I'd mention too, because there are two, oftentimes, kind of get through a strategic planning process and you're part way through it or fairly far down the line and all of a sudden two things come up. One is communications and the second is resources. And so I've seen it approached different ways. Um, in Perry, when we did our strategic planning, we were very upfront about our financial picture and that became one of our uh, strategies. And the other communications, we ultimately decided that it was so inherent in everything that it became a foundational piece underneath all the strategies. But I say that because I've seen it done both ways, where communications was a strategy, finances was a strategy, and I've seen them both as not a strategy, but assuming those are going to be what they are, they're foundational, so we find a way to recognize them. I have seen school districts go through a great strategic plan process, process and never once mention their, their financial resources. And um, so I get that. Sometimes uh, as educators, we want all the things, but we have to know there are personnel. That, so you guys all get that. I would just say that's one of the things early on probably that's more of a board decision is in particular how we want to approach the financial picture if that's going to be more of a foundational that we call out up front in the strategic plan or if it becomes one of the strategies we want to identify it as a strategy and if so thinking through what that looks like and what the goals might be and so forth because that that again politically might put you in a spot that you don't want to be in where when you approach it foundational i think you can remain a, a bit more general about it so it's again every district's different every um every situation the context you know can be different and so that that'll be something early on that we probably have some conversation of, about on on your end thank you anybody else questions thank you sir appreciate it okay thank you, thank you for the opportunity appreciate it appreciate it Item six, Mr. Craig Hawkenberry. Yes, uh, real quick. Uh, um, the first item is uh, uh, annually, uh, semi-annually, um, we have to present to the Board of Education the amount of bullying incidents, uh, defined bullying in incidents. Um, and if you turn over the agenda there, uh, 33, 19, 321, the revised code there under the Family Educational Act, and Privacy Act of 74, 1974, it's amended. Also, we list each one of our schools and the bullying incidents that have occurred. Uh, one at McKinley, 
uh, none at Poland Middle and one at the seminary. So um, as we talked before, I know sometimes those come out, at, you know, being low. Um, in order for it to make the list, it has to be, it has to meet the definition of bullying. So just because a parent says my kid was bullied doesn't necessarily mean that, that that's going to show up on there. Um, so that's our, we have to do another one in December and then another one again in May. Um, teacher appreciation is all week. We talked about that. I wanted to just make sure that you know that you're invited on Friday, uh, 1030. There's been events going on all throughout the district. They started Monday, but the big event is uh, Friday at 1030 at the connector. They have food trucks, um, all kind of opportunities. If you want to go down at 1030, it starts and it goes on. Uh, into the afternoon. Uh, also excited to announce that College Signing Day is um, at the seminary Monday, May the 15th um, at 2 o'clock. We have eight student athletes uh, going to the next level. So we're excited about that. <coughs> I know that everybody knows that Camp Fitch in Washington, D.C. are also coming up at the same time, May 17th through the 19th. Um, everything's been in place. Uh, I know they're thankful that you approved the, uh, both of these uh, trips are very important part of our school culture. Uh, also wanted to remind everybody that graduation for the class of 2023 um, will be on May the, uh, Saturday, May the 7th at 6 p.m. If you haven't RSVP'd, if you could let, let us know um, and uh, I'll get you more information as we move closer to the event. I know some people can't make it, uh, not a problem, but uh, just so you know. And also, I sent an email out. Um, I know we had some people that won't be able to make it, but Monday, May 29th, uh, the uh, Memorial Day celebration and parade, our uh, procession, um, is down at Court Street, I believe, Cortland. We have to meet at the American Legion. Um, great event. If you want to go, I need to let the commander know uh, if anybody from the board is going to be there. Uh, also wanted to take a minute to acknowledge uh, some uh, HR transfers real quick. Um, so I listed the internal uh, transfers. Our principals, our staff did a really good job of filling the vacancies. We anticipate by the 17th that we'll be more than 95% staffed for next school year because the principals and everybody interviewing did such a great job. Uh, there, all the staffing internal transfers are listed there. Um, I, I don't have to read them for you. I think you can see all those. Uh, that was all part of uh, retirements. Every time somebody retires, um, uh, an opening, we add a new position. People have the opportunities to apply for those positions, and they create vacancies throughout the district. And um, we have to have a process in place to make sure we can eventually uh, get that settled. So those were the transfers there. I think there were seven, one, two, three, four, five, six um, and we'll have some new hires on the next agenda in May, on May 17th. Um, those were all of mine, and I just wanted to let everybody know if you're um, not busy tomorrow, um, 11 o'clock, uh, WKBN, I think it's AM Radio 570, uh, the Dan River Show, I believe it's called. Uh, I'll be on there uh, talking about the facts of our facilities master plan. So tune in. Hopefully he'll go easy on us. We'll find out. <laughs> Probably won't. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Item seven, Janet Montine. So real quick, I gave you a couple handouts. If you could go to the massive spreadsheet I put together. Um, so just to recap, and I apologize, this is not up on the screen. The numbers would have been so tiny. So I just handed it out to the board. So we did RFP for our food service management. I've been keeping you up to date on all of that. We did get um, four um, proposals, which was good. So when we first went out to bid, we only received two the very first time. So I was happy that we got four people interested. Um, so I put this together because um, on bid opening day, of course, anybody that's there, they just want to go to the very bottom line and say, like, what's the profit? Okay, well, you can't really just look at that because you got to really kind of dig in and are we really comparing apples to apples? So what you're looking at on the left, on the revenue side, you see where it says RFP. So that's the information we had to put in our RFP. So that's actual data from the prior school year or this past school year. Um, and then on the bottom, of course, on the expenditure side, the only thing that I'm required to list is our 
our employee labor infringes, because that's the whole purpose of the RFP, is you guys are saying, what are you going to generate in revenue, and what's this going to cost? So I wanted you to be able to see what we put in the RFP, and then you can see SFE, AVI, and they, and they had an alternate TAHER, if I'm saying it right, or TAR, and then TNG, which is the nutrition group. So this, I felt, was so helpful because, like, right away, if you go clear to the bottom and you see in their proposals what they're saying the profit is in yellow, SFE is saying they're going to have a profit of $89,000 and TAHER $75,000, and you can see how the numbers were kind of all over the place. But when you... When you look at the top, the things that were alarming to me, and I have some notes at the bottom that I'll go over, our RFP for breakfast, we've been generating about $10,000 in revenue. So go, for instance, clear over to Taher. <laughs> if we've only been generating $10,000 in revenue, how for breakfast are you generating $30,000 in your proposal? You, you understand what I'm saying? That kind of throws a red flag to me, like that doesn't seem realistic to me. You know, and you can do the same for lunch. If our revenue for lunch was 167,000, you can see in their proposals across the board what they're saying they're gonna generate. So I don't need to go down through every line. You guys can see it. But what's alarming up there, and this was a bit disturbing, in our RFP, you see I used a, a student enrollment of 1715. Well, AVI put in a place in their proposal, 1,945 students. Well, why are you, we don't have that many students, so obviously your revenue numbers are too high because your student enrollment was wrong. The other line I wanted to point out, if you just go to the revenue and you see the variance, which obviously it makes the, the decision clear when you actually analyze the data, based on their proposals, what SFE is saying, clear over to Taher, they're saying that they are going to generate between $1,000 and $1,300 a day more in revenue. That's unrealistic. So the problem at the bottom is you can't just go, well, I'm going with SFE because the guarantee in the first year is $50,000, and they're saying we're going to have a profit in the first year of $89,000. Well, first of all, I don't think that's a even a realistic proposal and then if you go with someone like that well what do you do in the remaining four years because remember it's a one year and then four renewals with that being said i don't need to go down through every line i just wanted you to see why basically on the may the next week's board agenda we'd be recommending the nutrition group um, and then on my notes you can see a couple things at the bottom sfe only has two ohio clients i'm questioning their revenue um, AVI is the, out of all of them, other than Nutrition Group, are really the only other local proposal that we got. But again, I'm concerned about their student count. I believe that is wrong. And I, which you see, I put they don't have the correct enrollment and they only listed two um, clients. So um, Taher, right off the bat, you're, you're, you're saying that your breakfast revenue is three times the amount of what we are currently doing. And the other problem with Taher, I could have probably just threw their proposal completely out. In their proposal, you'll see where the labor and fringes is. They completely left out the $50,000 in fringes out of their proposal. So if they say that their profit's going to be $75,000, <laughs> Well, you left out $50,000 in fringes. It was nowhere in the proposal. So I wanted you to be able to see all of the proposals, um, why I would suggest we're sticking with the nutrition group. And then the first sheet that I gave you, <clears throat> this was the criteria that was in the RFP of how we were to score. The ODE requires three scores, so you can see um, and, and we don't put names on them. So three different people scored all the RFPs. It's obviously separated by the dashes. And then you can see total, really, um, AVI was maybe the closest to nutrition group after we did all the scoring. Um, but this OD is going to make me or require me to submit the scoring tabulation um, in order to award the contract. So I wanted to be very thorough on reviewing the proposals and 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 i think it's clear when you look at the data 
like which way we need to go. So and does anybody have any questions on um, the, the results of the RFPs? I think that's a typo. <laughs> I, I think that's supposed to be a it's a time up. I, yeah, five, five, yeah. <laughs> so five, over on the clear left, uh, Troy, those are the maximum points. And okay, uh, well, uh, but actually they should have got a six because they had like six pages of references. So um, two myself and two other people have to score because you have to have three scores. But um, thank you, because that is definitely a typo. It should have been 555, because they got the maximum for, um, for that particular category. Do the proposals give you any insights where they come up with their numbers? I mean, the, the oh, that's the other thing. On, OK, then the, and a lot of this was just for me, because a lot of them put like um, commodities in different places. So I had to like create a line in order to make sure I was hitting their numbers. But see the line that says used meal counts and I have no, yes, yes, no, and yes. So this is the other problem. And I, and I have paid, free, and reduced. So the RFP information on the revenue used meal counts. So the nutrition group and AVI were the only two proposals that actually did their proposal using meal counts. Our meal counts. Our, our meal counts based on the RFP. Yeah. SFE and Taher used dollar amounts. We just made it up. Not meal counts. So again, and a lot of those lines were for me as I was analyzing to try to understand like why does this seem so far off? It's just the other the other proposals. And I don't know, honestly. I don't have any experience with it. I don't know how you, how it would work with a company being like in Minnesota. You know what I mean? Like one was in Minnesota. I'm grateful that we got that much interest. And what was interesting is five years ago when it was the nutrition group, it was the Mets was the name of the other one. Well, they came to the walkthrough um, when I had it um, over Easter break but they didn't even end up sitting, submitting a proposal, which I thought was interesting because I thought we were actually going to have um, five instead of the four. Um, but regardless, um, th that's the results that that we got. So it's just a five-year contract, so one year. Five yeah. Years. Yep. So you do a one year, and then there's four four renewal peers. Guaranteed those if they ch so choose or no. No, there's a guarantee in each one. But just so you know, and I have it there on the guarantee, so if you go up to the admin and management fees for the nutrition group, they're around $22,000. If they don't hit their mark, what was in their proposal, the guarantee I have is half of the 22 because they don't guarantee, they only guarantee their fee. They don't guarantee the other fee. Um, and again, you know, when we were open, I'm, of course, a lot of the people, their eyebrows were going up because they're like, oh, my, my, uh, our profit's way higher than, and then I'm looking at the numbers. I'm like, yeah, but how are you going to produce that much revenue? If we only produce 10, how are you, what are you, what is it you're going to do to bring in $30,000 in breakfast revenue in one year? It, I just, it, I just don't think that can happen. So, so if you went with S SFE, they mm -hmm. guarantee $50,000 profit to us the first year. Yeah. Guaranteed. So how do they make that up in the last next four years? Well, that what's the what's what's on the back side of that? That's what I mean because the numbers obviously change right. every year. Labor, food, whatever. Um, but their profit. But again, I believe they can have a profit that high because if you look at their total revenue at six oh eight, they're estimating in the first year that they're going to bring in two hundred thousand dollars more. In revenue than the RFP. Yeah, but if they don't do that, you're still guaranteed the fifty thousand. You, we would be guaranteed the fifty thousand. And that's just for them to get the five year contract. Then in the next four years, they screw you out of something. Well, something that's what I said. So what do we do after yeah. that? Or what, do they do after or what did they do after that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to make sure that um, because obviously it's on the board agenda to award a contract for for this, and that's on next week. Okay. Any anybody else have questions? Perfect. Thank you. Number eight, Matt McKenzie operations. <clears throat> I gotta fix that. Six. 
So I just wanted to give everyone a quick update of some of the work that's going to get done over the summer and what these guys back here <laughs> has been dealing with uh, over the last couple months trying to figure out rooms and with um, everything going on there. So um, first off, we prioritized um, by student enrollment, increased student enrollment, um, class size reduction, you know, safety concerns first, uh, district pride aesthetics, and then anything else that wasn't in the master plan. So that's, that's kind of how we, we all approach that and going through there. So just going through the schools. So McKinley, um, what's going to happen is we have two new teaching stations this year. We have a kindergarten station and we have a second grade station. You guys can <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong on any of these, but uh, so kindergarten is going into the art room since the art teacher had using two rooms. So we're going to transform that room into a kindergarten classroom. Uh, there'll be some minor renovations. Uh, smart board has to be lowered, stuff like that. Nothing too, too large on that. Then the second grade classroom is going into 301. 301 currently has uh, four or five intervention specialists in that room. So what we have to do is we were displacing them uh, for the second grade classroom. So in the library, uh, what was come up, we came up with uh, put a wall, couple temporary walls, uh, full size walls. But if anything has happens down the road, you know we can take them down if need be. But it'll give four to five individual rooms smaller group size rooms for a teacher with four or five, I believe, students could fit in there, stuff like that. So for the intervention specialists. So that is one of the um, improvements, the large improvements that we're going to do. Uh, another thing is because of all the ridership um, there at McKinley, the track doesn't hasn't seen cars on it for many years and it has for the last couple years so we do have to increase um, some areas of the track and fix some other areas that are just disintegrating because of the cars so you'll see some work being done on the track we're not redoing the entire thing or adding you know another parking lot back there but it will be some some work being done on the track um, so one thing that just came up <laughs> this week um, that's going to happen this week, and just so in case you hear about it, so at McKinley, second floor restroom, there was some pipes in the wall that were leaking, um, some drain lines, so it was leaking into a classroom. I just wanted to make everyone aware while we're here that that restroom's closed down, and we already have it scheduled where we're going to bust out the wall and have to read redo some piping there. So that, that wasn't a summer work list, but since we're all here, in case you hear, hear about it outside of uh, schools, just wanted to bring that to your attention. So um, moving on to the middle school. So the technology classroom is located in the fifth grade wing right now. Um, so we, we have a new fifth grade teacher coming in or teaching station. So that technology classroom is going to be located in, uh, I believe it's B101, so on the lower level. Um, that, that room, we need to set it up just for technology, uh, teaching station, um, Wi-Fi, everything like that. Some minor modifications to that room. There's some ceiling tiles that ha that room has not been occupied in the last few years. So we are going to have to do some modifications. To it's that unoccupied lower. now, you said? It is so unoccupied now. Remodeled? Yeah, yeah. So um, not a complete remodel, but uh, we do have modifications and some repairs that have to be done in that, into that room. And then, of course, the technology um, or anything that's needed for that fifth grade classroom. A new um, doorway is being added to a restroom on the lower level that's handicap accessible and some new fixtures being put in there. Is that so at the middle school? That is at the middle school also. Sorry. So um, that's that will give our handicapped students uh, accessibility to the restroom that's down there already. So it just needs to needs to be opened up as yeah, far as that goes. Go upstairs on, on Currently the they have to. And, and then go to the restroom. So yeah. So we have we have to do that to be in compliance. Um, high school, so room 15 is uh, Mr. Sonato's room. And uh, so we are going to raise the floor in room 15 
by pouring concrete, putting new tile down. So this room, it was part of the original design of the building. The mirrored room was room 30, I believe, on the other side of the, um, the building. So the, room, well, the one with the, the single step down. So what happens is over years, we've, we've heard that you know, kids trip down it, um, staff members trip, and it's just a safety hazard. So room 30 years back, was raised up. We're gonna we're gonna duplicate that um, in 15. It's it's time we have to get rid of that. <laughs> the, the, any of those trip hazards and safety issues. Yeah, the uh, treasure trips, and we get a new floor. <laughs> I, I, I see how this works. It, it, no, it was. It, it's been a. My foot still is not even right. I'm dead serious. I can't we, even turn my foot to one one direction without getting pain to yeah. this day. Did I really screwed my foot up? I years ago. I, I tore a I bunch think of we had a parent in my foot. that fell. Uh, was it a is a grandmother that fell and seriously hurt herself? Oh, yeah. I heard about that. I yeah, they're on the board at the time. Kevin, did not, someone but... fall in that room and like at conferences or something? Someone said that it was during parent teacher conferences or something that a Yeah, it would have been a couple years back. Mm -hmm. So there there are, and even with my kids going through there, yeah, you know, it's been yeah, you know, so many trips down it. It's it's time to start fixing these these little these they're not little problems but some of the problems out there so um that that's getting done this summer um the library at the high school so we're we're going to do some light modifications um to the library at the high school we're going to add some walls to the library um what this is going to do is it's going to give us some additional meeting space some testing areas um just anything that they need. Right now, if there's one kid testing in the library, I, and I did this the other day, I walked in, I had to turn right around. So, so if, if we need that extra space, especially now that we have more meetings, um, more intervention, we have more testing going on, we have seventh and eighth grade, we, we definitely need those spaces. And then it also allows our regular classrooms to use the library, the rest of the library, when something small is going on, instead of closing off the entire area. So it's a better use of space. So um, that's gonna be done. There's gonna be some, um, minor, like I said, minor modifications, walls, couple doors to make them separate testing areas. Nothing, nothing crazy as far as that would go. Um, the other thing with all of this going on is, you know, you're gonna need furniture for, for new classrooms. Um, we've utilized as much furniture from North and from Union throughout all of these, these um, different moves that we've made. Um, I know we have preschool coming here and uh, we were just talking actually today, you know, we might have to, to look at some different furniture for the additional preschool classroom. So these things are always moving. So as we, as we find these out, you know, we're working together to, to put these in the budget. Uh, district wide, you know, continuation of the safety grant. We've got some doors replaced. We're going to do some cameras. Um, we just actually just talked today about SRO stations. So uh, this is conversation that we're having right now that I know Mr. Snyder and Chief Wilson talked about, and I know that um, it was also talked about at the connector area is to move those SROs closer to our front doors and what would that look like, um, whether it's a, a small desk. So they're the first, those SROs are the first people that our public sees as they're entering. So um, I did talk to the fire department to make sure that egress and everything was taken care of today. So we are good to continue with that, uh, moving forward with that in, in those plans. So that's a good thing. Um, some aesthetic up, up uh, grades we're gonna do. So we have beautiful facilities. We have um, new softball field, baseball field that needs done. Those are not getting touched by the facility master plan. The field house is not on the facility master plan. We have graduation coming up. You know, we're, we're continuation of taking that Poland Pride a little further step. We're gonna do some landscaping around there, some trees. Um, I actually have a meeting with our neighbor um, behind the softball field on Friday to, to go over what that's going to look like behind their house. So we're, we're trying to 
to continue that throughout the district. Um, another thing that we're doing is painting the exterior of the locker room, weight room, uh, over there um, at the stadium. It's, it hasn't been painted that I know of in many years, so um, it's, just, it's a continuation of taking pride in what we have and, and everything that we do as far as that goes is not part of the facility master plan. So, which leads to the biggest thing that's not part of the facility master plan, and it's up there, is, is the uh, RFQ for the bus garage and the bus terminal. So, we sent the RFQ out. Um, we've had seven responses, which was, which was great for design services. Um, it's a much needed relocation of the bus terminal. We, we're gonna be able to utilize that space, but until we get the design service company narrowed down, uh, we can't start that design process. So with those seven, um, I took them and I evaluated each one of them. Um, we're going through the evaluation process. Then we're going to call them in in the next few weeks. Um, probably just a panel of us, you know, here at central office, interview them, then make our recommendation. So we're, we don't want to rush this because this is going to, this location or relocation of the bus garage will most likely be the last time it happens. So we gotta, we gotta find the best fit, the exact needs, the best cost. So what's that gonna, what's that gonna look like? Um, the way this is evaluated is a little different than the RFP, mm -hmm. just so everyone knows. Cost has nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to evaluate them on past work experience, how well they budget, gets examples of that. Um, what they what their services include whether they're going to be on site every day whether there's meetings or whether they're just going to design it and and be done that's what our evaluation is once that goes through and we make that recommendation and we accept that or the board accepts that then we negotiate the price with them so we can you know they're going to ask for 10 percent of total cost uh, total cost is unknown at this time Due to, due to the problems of, we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like. We know we need a fueling station. We know we need a, a transportation garage. We know we need a lot, but are we gonna move the maintenance building over there also? Are we going to put a wash bay in? Do we need a lift? So they're gonna want 10% of the total cost. And that's where we negotiate with them to say to to come up with that final price so just so everyone knows their their cost is not in this evaluation whatsoever which is unlike the rfp mm -hmm. um and and we plan on moving forward with a recommendation to you in june um, for the services after that once that happens we'll negotiate the price we'll start getting together stakeholders transportation bus drivers mechanics all of us to, to figure out what's going to happen, location, get everyone's input, and then move forward with the design. Then it'll have to be bid out after we do we quite a come process. up with the cost. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's not going to be a it's not going to be a 2023-24 school year uh, finished product, but we have to be moving forward. And this that is has nothing to do with the master plan. Right. So I just making sure that everyone knows what we have going on for this summer and then also the large project, the next large project that the school's looking at. So, all right. Thank you. Um, so item nine, I added this on uh, to talk about uh, facilities master plan and I heard your discussion on the MLO brothers. Mm -hmm. So I just had a couple questions and I want the board to join in. So obviously the bond passes in November, this is all moved. If the bond fails, do we have, do we have, you talk about going to the, the red plan. If the bond fails, do we have a plan based on what, how bad it fails to go back to the voters yes. for the same plan? Does the board have a number in mind? In other words, if it fails 70, 30, what are we doing? If it fails uh, 59, 41, where, where does the board stand? Yeah, 
And what's the date? And again, I know you talk about the March primary, but if we were to go back immediately and do it again, what's the earliest we could do? It would be May. Oh, okay. We got to pay to put it on. Yeah. Oh, well, we pay no matter what. Every renewal, we get charged. You get charged depending on how many things are on the ballot. But will we, is there going to be an election today with the primary being in March? Or still I'm sorry, it'll be in March. It's in March. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then, then so I don't. So we can't go to November then for the time frame. Because I don't think we'd make the window. I agree with that. You have to be just like the resolution that we'll be doing next week. You, I mean, I'm one month ahead, but you have 120 days out, and then that wouldn't be 120 days from November to March. It's early March or late March? Early March. Early. Yeah, it's usually early to mid March. Okay, so that answers that question. So you got to go to November, but it's it, it, it just yeah. There's no office election anymore. There's not. They actually voted on it today, so, so that's there's no. There's not a there used to be an option to go on in August. Not very many people did, but that's not an option anymore. Even, even if there was one in August, it would be really expensive for us because we'd be responsible for paying for the entire election. Okay, so so, so if we were to go again, it would be the following year, President Jams. Is there a uh, percentage that the board feels that they would, I mean, because if we go to the red plan, then, then the blue plan's moved. Yeah, well. I mean, if you move forward with building classrooms at the high school, mm -hmm. if you go through that whole red plan that you talked about, yeah. we're not going to go back. To That's this. correct. You guys would have to decide if the if it would fail at the election. We need to huddle up, and we need to come up with what we want to put back on and when, obviously. I think, though, um, there's a couple things, like, that I, it, it are going to be interesting to watch. So Canfield... Um, using them as an example, because they went before us, um, they got beat really badly at the polls. They put it back on, and most districts probably wouldn't have done that because it was so bad. They didn't make too many modifications to their plan, the costs, or anything. So it'll they, be interesting. They took it off. No, it's it's on. But they waited a year and a half. It, it didn't. And no, they were just on last year. They were just on last year. Yeah. And it lost. It's back on. Now it's back on. They were on when last year? November. November. So it failed horribly in November. Okay. And now this November, they're back on. Okay, yeah, so it's just been a year. It's just been yeah. one year. Okay. I, think they, I think what they did is they changed their plan, though. They so, changed yeah. Their plan. But I guess my point is, is you're, you're talking about, Canfield didn't make any modifications. Not that they're planned to the buildings. They didn't right. spend any money. Right. You're talking about if it fails in November, we have to go to plan red. That's going to cost. We're going to make modifications. Yes. We need to make modifications. Yeah. yeah. We don't want to undo them by putting the space back. We're not going to do plan red and then put blue right. back on. Right. Right. Blue is done. Blue is done. We go red. Right blue is done. Right. Blue's done. Yeah. For, for the time being. Yeah. Um, I was doing. It's 119 days between October, November, March. I, I, I just said it's like 17. I can look at my. I can look at my. There's got to be a way to get it. Right. It'll probably be a little over 120 days because when we had the last presidential primary, I think it was on March 17th. So, oh, so it's a little bit later in the month. It could possibly be March depending on how the votes come out. So I, I guess that's something that I want to know is that mm -hmm. if, if we have the ability to put it on in March, we, probably we, we need to know, or at least as a group have an idea, if it fails 70 to 30 like Canfield, is that something that we're going to move forward on in March or are we going to plan red, and if it fails better than that, we're going to go for it one more time, because I don't, I certainly don't want to make modifications to high school and all, everything that plan, I don't want to dump this one sure. and go right to plan, you know, yeah. to the red plan. But, but people are asking if it fails, what, what is your, what are you going to do? Right. Well, on the, tr on the trail, and in the conversations with everybody, we tell them that, you know, option red 
it, it just it, it it's not really an option it's our plan if it fails we just tell them that okay if, if we choose no then we have to abate the overloads at McKinley no matter what we're out of space and so we have to move those kids out and we ran at the retreat we ran three different scenarios we we could move the kindergartners here and that would abate the overloads and or we could reopen Union or we could reopen North and we had a we had a cost set for all of those um, but the red plan does include reopening it, it does, but we backed off of that and we made the adjustment because it financially, literally, we have to, we immediately fall into, I don't want to say I can, or, uh, um, financial emergency, three, but three years from now, in less than yeah, three yeah, years, we're, we're in. Yeah. Well, I disagree with that. I think you guys are going about that the wrong way. Yeah. You should. So what would be the what what what, what, what are you we, adding to Plan Red then? Yeah, because we have to discuss something. We can look at we have two buildings. We got the four. You can look at reopening the Union. You can look at reopening North. And a new one at seven and eight. It's crammed. Yeah. Parents don't like. It. I, I guess my point is, if it fails and you go to Plan Red, you you you've, you've screwed any other opportunity to do anything else. Do you? Because what I hear is. Something smaller will probably pass. So, do we do we say we're putting this on in November? If it fails, do we come back and say, okay, we heard you. We're going to go one building, yeah. K through five. Down, we're stuck in McKinley. We got to go. We got to go there. We put that on instead of going plan red. Why do we have to go to McKinley? Because of the deed restriction. Okay. You're tied in. You're tied in. So, I mean, those are things that I think we need, we need to Yeah, I think what we, to, yeah, after the election and we have some yeah. data, I think we need to do, we need to do a retreat and we need to talk about it. Yeah. But segmenting it out is always an option. But the problem with segmenting is if we build a K-5, like say, say they said, I voted no, because we're going to have to, we're going to have to meet with people and find out why they voted no. We're just going to say, you know, if it was the cost, then we definitely could segment it out. But if I we mean segment it out. That's the plan. You're yeah. just building one school. You're going to keep seven and eight at the high school, and you're putting K through K up here, and one through six somewhere else. Not with the intent of going back to the voters. Yeah. Because I think, I mean, I don't know. I just don't think that. I, I think to answer your question, why are they voting no? One is the cost. Yeah. I don't think it's because they don't want to build it north or whatever. I think it's going to be. It's all about money. Well, yeah. They'll they'll tell us. So I mean that's why I wanted to have the discussion. Sure. On that show, you said we were going to write, go right to the red plan. Yeah. And Stephanie was like, "You need to have a vision. You need to have a vision. You need to follow the vision. Well, our vision is this. It's going to change if you go to the red plan. Yeah. And you, there's no going. In my opinion, if, it, if you're putting classrooms at the high school, building classrooms at the high school, in the red plan, you're not going back to putting a new high school. At that. Yeah, agreed. So the the red plan is. It, it doesn't have a, like, we're not, we wouldn't do it the day after the election. So we have time, November, December, January, February, March, to come up with a modif modified plan of what we're going to do. The good thing about it is, is we have a lot of options because we have assets. We have buildings. And, you know, we could take out a loan. We can, we can do temporary things, too. But, you know, I'll caution, though, I, I keep, uh, if we segment it out, like, just say we just built one, one building. 
it's going to be very difficult to say, let's build a K-5. So I want you to think about this. Half of our population will be going to school in an elite facility with everything modern, safety, technology, everything. So they're going to go six years in that building, and then they're going to leave in the sixth grade, and they're going to go to a 200-year-old building, and then they're going to go to a high school that's 60 plus years old. My, my only comment, they've been doing that for 100 years ago. Right, but they're, the buildings are old. If the high school was nicer than the middle school. Union was always old. I mean, I, I, I don't know that that, I don't know that that's, I agree with you. Yeah. I don't know that that's big, that big of a deal that people are going yeah. to ultimately make the decision. Are you looking at putting this on November or March? You said we have all this time. If we're going to March, we have a very little time. Well, I, I don't think, I, I, back yeah. Back yeah. We're going to find that out. We're going to yeah. find out if we're going to we'll find March. Out. I guess my advice to you would be, if it fails, we have multiple different options that we're looking yeah. at as opposed to plan red, because you're going to get stuck with plan red. People are going to say, oh, I see plan red. That's what you said we're going to do if it yeah. fails. So I'd just be careful with that. Just sure. Just don't. Yeah. And if, you need to, if yeah. you need to have all of those things vetted in, on a plan before the election. I think we as a group could discuss it, but I think that Put everything behind the, yeah. the election. You well, know, I, I think our uh, I think our immediate need is if if pass or fail, and I don't I don't even know how much time we have left at McKinley. I mean, I don't know how much more commandeering and renovations that we can do. Um, we got we're adding another teacher there next year, a third grade teacher, and now, and I know it's it's a tough conversation. We, we will have added eight staff in two years, or three years, I'm sorry. We will have added eight staff. Those staff all have to have planning time. Yeah. So now we got to talk about adding specialists. We added a halftime art to try to abate some of that. Eventually, we're going to be out of specialists. So space is going to be well, at a complete premium. Yeah. We're going to have to include opening another building. Yeah. I, I never explored the loan, and I don't even know. Can we get, we would have just paid off the loan, mm -hmm. and we could take out a loan if that, I mean, that could be part of the discussion, yeah. But here's the cost we have to think about building another building. It's not just the cost of renovating the building. It's the cost of administration. It's the cost of custodial. If there's all That's why in those half the one is at the retreat, right. that was just very yeah. high level saying, okay, no, 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 we know for sure we need this, this, and this, but that's why I shared without having all at the our polling thing, without having a master schedule to know what works and what doesn't work, you may have to add tons of staff if you do that because you wouldn't know until you develop a schedule, a, a district-wide master schedule with these configurations and look at your teachers to say, okay, can this person make it from here to here? Can we share this person? Because if the answer in that master schedule is no, like Michelle's saying, and that's why that, that was like, this is just, we know you need this, this, and this, but once you get down to every single person that it takes to operate a school, I would have no idea unless we did that of what staffing we would need. And the cautionary tale, too, is, um, and I'm not advocating, okay, because I'm not allowed to, right? I'm just telling the facts. If option red is appealing, then we need not put on the bond. Because people will think, well, I'll go to this option because right. it'll be easy. I'm just going to vote no. They have a plan in place. So yeah, we, have, uh, we have to be very careful right. with saying you don't want to give people an out to right. say, okay, it's fine. I, 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 you know. See, the, the, the finances speak for themselves. Yes. The problem is, is are people going to look at the finances yep. to make a decision? Because that's what I tell my patients. Is they ask, well, what you're just, you got to look at the finances. That tells the story. Tell me you don't want to pay more taxes, but finances tell you when you're going to pay them because yeah. you're going to pay them sooner or later. You know, no matter what, the community is going to put the bill yeah. whether they pay taxes or not because they're not saving money by not asking. The, um, the timeline that we would have is we have until December 20th to file for the March primary. We have two. So there'd be a little bit of time. Sure. So, 
do you like so that in that time period from November till we have to put it on if, if it would fail we would have to we have to come up with another plan though completely different blue options out then right well no not necessarily I mean I think it depends on how we, bad it fails yeah that's true we could yeah yeah what's the number you, you had a great question what's the what yeah what's our number what's our number do you remember, is there, I don't know if you can pull it up, what the last bond that we attempted here at Poland, how I bad? Say, I want to say 70-30. I mean, it was pretty high. 70-30? Yeah. 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 No. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, it was 60-40. And what, do we remember what, how much that was? So, was it well, it was million? just one campus. But the, our, our last selection on would be Debbie Downer, but whatever was on in May, in the state of Ohio, I believe there were only two or three issues that passed. Oh, you mean in in May? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just I, I think the yeah. strategy-wise, I think putting it on a presidential election, especially this one, more people are going to vote. More people go to the polls. That, I don't know that, help, that helps us, though. Well, I think if it's not 65 to 80, age range historically vote no on school bonds and levies, right? 65 to 80, and they re religiously go to the polls. But on a presidential election, you get your 18 all the way up, especially the last few elections, um, they've been packed. So it would almost seem like the more voters, the better percentage we have a good chance, so. Anybody else? All right, I need a motion recommending entering executive session to consider the employment, employment, dismissal of public employee or official and matters required to be kept confidential by federal law. I'll make a motion. A second. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 And we will reconvene in the work session and adjourn. No further.